So, ma'am, it's your turn to sit next to your sister. Thank you. Without wasting our time, I'd like to invite our second speaker for a lead paper. Please welcome Sade. Thank you very much, ma'am. Good afternoon. It's always a tough act to follow Abiba. I just want to say concur, concur, and sit down. Let's take the question and answers. Because I think it's almost the same things that she's mentioned. Actually, Abiba and I shared an office for a period. So actually, we are coming from the same stock. So it's pretty much the same things that we'll be talking about. Um, I think having worked in HR, I always pride myself that I manage the most important asset of any business. I believe people are the ones that are the engine to your business. They are the lifeline of any business, but they are also the ones that can kill any business. So the real key is how do you manage people in a manner that turns to value for the business that you're running? Am I? What am I? Oh, okay, I just need to wait. So I can still be yarning my story as I, as I wait for that. So as I was saying, I said people are the most important part. And the first thing we'll be talking about is regardless of what it is that you're trying to do, if you don't have the right people in terms of how you select them, if you're not able to retain and develop the right people, then you probably don't even have a business in the first instance. And I think Abiba mentioned, oh, okay. Abiba mentioned when she was talking, many times as small businesses, we actually think we don't have the time and the resources required for us to put people on the agenda. We're busy looking for the financing and looking for the office space and looking for the customers and basically chasing a lot of the very important things. But at the heart of all of those important things is recognizing that if you have not thought through the people that will manage the funds and the people that will interface with those customers, the people that will use the resources that you're putting together, then you have not started at all. Because the same way you gather it is the same way it will filter away, except you have the right people in place. What am I pressing? Okay, this one. Okay. Um, so in terms of structure, I'll just talk about a few of the common mistakes that SMEs make. What is a proper structure to have in place? Um, let me go back, because I think Abiba talked about the strategies and I'll be talking about the structures that you need to have in place to retain um, your people. What am I pressing on? Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> so I'm looking at the people management structures and the models that could help you. And to some extent, reiterating because the what works best is what Habiba has already said. Just breaking down a bit more into some of the structures that you can probably use to drive that. I just mentioned that no, an organization, no matter how well designed or how well intentioned, it is only as good as the people who live and work in it. And I think one of the key things we need to remember when we're talking about people is on average, people will spend the bulk of their time at their workplace. So if you look at the time it takes you to get to work, the number of hours you spend at work, many structured organizations will say you do 40 hours, but you and I know in real time, people will normally do on average 12 hours a day, on average. So you, they're basically spending their lives in the workplace. So it's really important that we look at what are the things about the people who work for us. We need to think about what mattered to us when we also worked for people. I've even mentioned a very key factor that the millennials are different from many of us in this room. But do you know what? Human beings at the heart of it are the same. Everybody wants to be fulfilled at what they do. People want to be acknowledged for what they do. People want to be rewarded for what they do. The expressions might be different. A millennial wants more flexibility. The Generation X and Baby Boomers want more stability. At the heart of it, what they are looking for is expression. So it's really important that when you look at what the people who work for you are, are, are seeking, 
understand what do I also want? What did I want in the first instance? And how can I ensure that they get the same experience? So what are some of the common mistakes? People come and start work, there's no job description. All you know is I need somebody to be in the office, but you have not defined what it is that the person is meant to be doing. If you cannot define it, it means you cannot hold them to account. Hiring too fast without substance. I'll drill a bit more on the hiring. <coughs> because there are many times we just go through the process, your sister sends somebody, then you've hired the person, and tomorrow the person is working, but you haven't really thought through what it is that you're hiring for. Number four, failure to comply with the law. We all know in Nigeria, if you have a certain number of employees, you must give them pension. How many of us are paying pension? Medical insurance, how many of us are providing covers for our staff? How many of us allow our people to go on maternity leave when they should go on maternity leave? So it is very important that regardless of how small you are, your essence and value has to be right. And one of the key values that will sustain your business is to ensure that you follow the law going forward. Number five, not rewarding successes. They've gone and brought the customers. You've had that show, it was fantastic. What did they get? I think one of the differences, you know, in small companies, people have a clearer line of sight as to where the money is coming from. So when, you, when they go and collect that check for you, they know exactly how much you got paid for that event. And then after they've collected that 5 million Naira check, come end of the month, you're now paying 25,000. So it is important that we reward success. I won't overemphasize a bit around the employee um, engagement and communication, the atmosphere that you create, and the other bit is not allocating sufficient funds to development. In many cases, even big companies do this. Once there's a recession, what is the first thing that they hit? Training budget. There's no training this year because there's no money. And at the heart of it, the people who will stay with you are the ones who feel that you invested in them, regardless of what was going on. So let's not overflog the mistakes, because you won't make those mistakes. I think the important thing to bear in mind is nothing happens by chance. So if you're going to be able to attract and retain the right people, you're going to be planning for it. You're going to be working for it. And that is the only way all of that will come together. I don't know where this machine is. It looks, it looks very much like it. <laughs> eh? Oh, I need to do it twice. Oh, did it move? To? Oh, it's moved twice, yeah. Okay. So first, I would like to focus on some of the key things I, I believe you need to look at when you're looking at the structures that need to be in place. I always start with the context. What really is the purpose of your business? And to be honest, whether you are big or small, all of this can just be you alone in your bedroom, sitting down and taking it step by step, peeling it and drilling it down, what are the things that I need? Abiba asks a question, who is your, wh which age bracket would your workforce come from? Which age bracket will your customers work come from? Which market are you trying to reach? All of that needs to precede you even hiring one person. Before you go and bring any other person to yourself, you need to invest some time in thinking through, what really am I trying to create? And this could be you and somebody else, a body, a partner, faith foundation, people that can help you refine your thinking around that process. I'll come back to the culture because I think Abiba nailed that quite a bit. But I want to focus on some of the key enablers. The first thing you always look at is, when you have thought through what it is you're trying to achieve, you've discovered what is a strategy, what's the best way for me to do this. You now need to begin to hold all of those things down. What kind of structure is your organization going to have? 
before you draw job descriptions, there has to be a structure in which that description fits. Is it a flat organization? Is it hierarchical? Why does it have to be hierarchical? Because when Abibe was talking, there are some level of businesses where the skill set that you need is pretty experienced, you know, semi-skilled, university graduates, and all of that. But I'm sure there are some of us in this room who the people we need are coming pro probably straight out of secondary school. Or probably some don't even have any formal education requirement. What structure you put in place has to tie in with what business you're trying to create. If the people are going to be low skill, then it means you have to put in structures with supervisions and control. If it is a more mature or more experienced workforce you have, then you have to be able to give them a lot more flexibility to apply their intellectual capacity. So you have to think through what exactly is the model that works. Again, it doesn't have to be fixed because where you start is not where you are going. But you must have a vision for what that end point is and how do I then get there in terms of the structures that I put in place. It is only when you have the structure that you can begin to talk about the people that you will hire. Abiba made a point in terms of the descriptions, trying to hire not for qualification, but for the skills and experiences that you need. Nigeria, we can collect degree. You will see some people, it's a whole page. They've taken first, second degree, A, second degree, B, second degree, C. All of it does not translate to any value for, it, for you. So you need to be clear what are the value drivers for which you are ready to pay your buck for and how do you then articulate that. The other thing I would mention is there is no perfect employee. So if you're not going to invest in people, you will probably be underselling your business. So you also need to prioritize what are the things that are important in the hiring process. If the attitude is what is most critical, then sometimes you will trade in a little bit of educational qualification for the right attitude. But you need to be clear what exactly are the parameters that you are, re you are recruiting for. The other bit is around your processes. There is no organization that is too small to have an employee manual. If you hire one person, there must be some guidance and codes that will manage even your relationship with that person. What happens when they don't come when they're supposed to? What happens when there's sickness? What happens when agencies or you require them to go over and beyond what you have defined? Because we will write job descriptions. In many cases, job descriptions will take 80%. But there's always that factor of what you do not yet know. And you need people to step into it. How do you document all of that in a manner that allows the person to feel validated and not being taken advantage of? If every day you keep coming, you say, I'm supposed to work 8 to 5, but permanently you expect me to be there till 10. And you are not rewarding, there's no overtime, there's nothing. How is that individual supposed to feel? So it's very important that your processes, your manuals are already in place from get-go to help you manage some of those things. I'll talk a bit more around the development and the rewards structures that you need to have particularly. And the other bit is when you look at the full life cycle, you attract people, you will develop them, you will retain some, and some will go. Abiba mentioned the revolving door. You can reduce your flux if the develop and retain work, you know, if you enhance those two. But the reality of any business is that there are some people that even you will choose to disengage. So <laughs> no, it's just the reality. Some people have to leave. So you must at every point in time bear in mind on what basis do I disengage? And one of the key concepts I always tell my team is how do I disengage with respect? Because many of the people who work for you are your ambassadors. 
I'm sure for some of you who are small businesses, you know how many of your customers, your former employees would have taken. Because there are many cases interfacing with the customers directly. If they go back and badmouth your business, your, cu your customer will move somewhere else, probably with them. So it is very important that we also look at how we manage our people. So I'd just like to focus a bit. The Maslow's hierarchy of needs, many of us are familiar with it, and many of us have gone through that level. I want you to look at your people in the context of where they are on that hierarchy. A man who cannot eat, who does not have a roof over his head, is not going to join you to save world hunger. Because the only hunger that he's hearing is his own hunger right now. So we need to walk through the levels. There are other kids that you are probably employing whose parents have taken care of their shelter, they've taken care of their sleep. So when you tell them to come and march, they are ready to march to save the world because they have food and they have a roof. You are the only one who knows your own employee. But what I'm going to say is you must ensure that the baseline is met before you start moving them up the ladder. There are four key areas, uh, and it's just exactly the same thing. I mean, uh, um, Amina, Amina is her sister. <laughs> it's the same thing Habiba just um, talked about, which is the four quadrants of the attracts to let develop, and I'll just touch a bit more in terms of what you can do. But I hope this really resonates with you, that at the heart of every human being is a desire for self-actualization. But how soon they will get there, and what steps are required for them to get there, is what will make the difference. Some of them will be happy to stay with you because with you, they will fulfill their self-actualization. But what you also want to do is enable those who need to find that self-actualization working somewhere else. This is a bit small, but I will just um, read through it. On hire and selection, <coughs> I just want to leave a few lessons. Regardless of the size of your business, hire for substance, not relationships. Many of us are using our businesses as the breeding ground to employ all our relations. That I have a friend who told me, she says, I would rather be paying that person's salary, let them stay at home, than for them to come into my business. Because once people become part of your business and you shackle yourself, in a way that you are not able to manage them effectively, then they become an albatross around your neck. You can imagine an employee that is not delivering. And for you to fire them, your mother, your auntie, everybody has to call family meeting. You don't need it. And I like the way Abiba put it, because there has to be clear hurdles. People only value what they fought for. So if they are not competing for jobs, if it is not clear what your hiring process is, then you might get into situations where you employ people that you cannot disengage from. And once you have people within your organization you cannot disengage from, they become poisonous to the organization. Because others will come, see the way they behave, and decide that that is the right way for people to behave. The other point I made is, it is a small business. Even some big businesses do it. Be part of your recruitment process. Even if you outsource it, the final selection, make your decisions for yourself. There are certain things about qualifications and all of that, but there is also the instinct and the vibes that you get from people. And you must be able to make that personal connection with the people that you hire. The other reason is be clear why you are recruiting. I think I like the discussion when we're talking about the digital bit, and it's like, oh, do I hire for it? Do I do it myself? Whatever the case. Whatever your decision, everybody who comes into your organization is going to cost you not just money, they're going to cost you time, and they're going to cost you your emotions. So you really want to look at the total cost of hiring people and be clear why you hire them. I think I put a quote there, Jack Welsh, who says, if you pick the right person, and give them the opportunity to spread their wings, and you use compensation as a career, you probably don't need to manage them. 
if you have the right people on board, the effort required to manage them on an ongoing basis is a lot less than if you have a round, a round peg in a square hole and you are just trying to shave the thing and force it to fit. The other bit, I think, like um, Abiba said, develop win-win. People will only work for you if there's something in it for them. They might be showing up at the office or the workplace, but they will only truly work for you if there's something in it for them. One of the key things I always emphasize is the discretionary value. Human beings are the only instruments that have a discretionary value. They can choose to give you, and they can choose to hold it. What you want to um, connect to is the ability to give it to you. I'm sure there are times you see people, and we also do it sometimes, you see something going wrong. But it's not every time you see something going wrong that you step up to it. Why? Because sometimes it's not my business. Did they pay me for that one? I let them go and fix it themselves. And once that opportunity is gone, you've lost value. So being able to connect in the win-win. I always tell, and it doesn't always have to be something fancy. I had a younger sister who used to run a fashion um, business. The tailors, they can't read. So everything is by instruction. You will give them, you will measure everything, cut it, then they will sew. So, but you can't allow people to come in and live the way they came. So at a certain point in their business, at a certain point, the tailoring shop turns to a school. You start from the basics, reading and writing. So that when people come, there's something that they go back with. And that was why I liked this point Henry Ford made. He said, a business that makes nothing but money is a poor business. If all you are counting at the end of the day is how much I've made, then that business is a poor business. Because your value as a business owner has to go into the lives of those who work for you and how you affect them. <coughs> Learning culture from get-go. One of the key things about business is on the mistakes that they've learned and they've made. But your, your failure can only turn to profit if you learn from it. So how do you then build learning into the culture? After, there are some things we call after action reviews. It means after every event, what went well? What didn't go well? How do we do it differently next time? It is a 10, 15 minutes conversation. But those are the things of your business so that on an ongoing basis, you are learning. People who know Mr. A, you did this job well. Let Mr. B go with you tomorrow so he can shadow you. It's not costing you anything. But it has to go into the structure that you create. The other bit is about tracking performance. And I said tracking performance and tracking it transparently. Not every business needs to have scorecard. But everybody in your company needs to know what is good performance and what is bad performance. Everybody needs to know what will be rewarded at the end of the day. So regardless of what it is that you're doing, everybody must know whether they're on the right track or they're on the wrong track. So I don't want to prescribe, again, if you go online, there are two bullet points, two paragraph assessments that you can use. But you have to build performance management into the fiber of your organization. I know I talk a lot, so please. <laughs> On the ones that I think are very critical for me, reward. One of the key things around retaining people is what you pay them. I've talked about, I think that table talked about paying uh, peanuts and getting monkeys. What you, what you pay is what you'll get. Again, the intention is not that you pay the top dollar. You see, it's important that you find the right person for your own type of business, but they also need to be fairly rewarded. I always remember, this story has never left me since 19, I think it was 1992, when we were running um, a recruitment process, 1994, in Shell. The guy who came out top 
who was offered the job did, did not take the job. To work, it was IT we were recruiting for. He didn't join Shell. He went to work for a software company that was probably paying, I'm sure they can't pay him half of what Shell was offering him. But you have to ask yourself, what was the value they were offering that money could not make up for? He felt the development, the line of business was more in tune with what he wanted to do. So it is not always about the money. But I must say that even though it's not always about the money, the money matters for some people. So he's looking at what is the fair structure in which to, um, to run your reward for your business. The one that always came to my mind when I was thinking about this is in America, the, the restaurant business and the waiters and waitresses. You go into a restaurant and the waiters and waitresses are falling all over you. Before you cough, they are there. You want one roll of bread, they will give you five. Why? Because their reward structure is tied to their, um, to their tip. So what do you do with that? As a restaurant owner, you get two in one. You get customer satisfaction because the individual is going to go over and beyond to satisfy the customer and then the customer is paying half of the salary for you in the tip. So you have to look at your business and say, with my model, what works? If it is a retail business, can I do commission? Can I put base and put some commission, which drives the sales as well? If it is a back-end office and I'm doing only base, what are the kind of benchmarks I want to put in place to compare the right pay for the right job? I won't talk again about the employee engagement, pulse check. Sometimes, if all of you are sitting in the room together, when you come in, you will know who is happy and who is not happy. For big companies, you probably need to press a button on a computer to say, I'm happy today or I'm not happy. But you can see it. What do you do with it when you see that? When you come in and people are not connected, what do you do with that piece of information that they've just given to you? I won't talk about the compliance anymore. On the disengagement, I said, don't be afraid to let go. <clears throat> it's okay for people to go. Like I said, some people you want them to go because they're cancer to your organization. And some people, you want them to go because they need to develop themselves. You've brought them to a level where what is next is outside of what you can give them. But those are people who become ambassadors for your business. And I like the way um, Abiba put it. Some of them you will rehire because the grass is always greener on the other side. Times they will go out, they will test it, and they will see that, you know, it's not exactly what I thought it was. The door is always open. I had a very interesting conversation with a lady two days ago on Sunday. She has a staff who is resigned. And she's like, this person has been fantastic. I don't want to stop her going because she also needs to actualize herself. But her question really was, normally gratuity, many companies will pay gratuity after 10 years. She's done five. Can I pay her a gratuity? I was like, of course you can pay a gratuity. You define what level you want to pay gratuity. If three years is long enough for you, pay a gratuity. But what struck me was the person was on their way out. And she was not doing it to lure them to stay. She was doing it out of genuine gratitude for the service that they've already given to her business and where they've taken it to. So how you manage this engagement is extremely important in terms of whether people will continue to promote your business or they'll be busy tearing it down. Now, having said that, you must be firm with bad behavior. We cannot say because we want everybody to be happy. Somebody will steal you blue and blind, then you'll be shaking them when they are going. Because once you do that, the signal to the rest of the organization is, it is okay to steal. You will still get a handshake. So you must be clear, when it's bad behavior, you must call it. If it is not acceptable, you must call it. 
But where people are living, and you know you still want to tap into that resource, then you also must leave the door open for a respectable disengagement. The last thing I would like to, and to be honest, you see this last quote. Disengaged employees are ambassadors of organizations. Treat them as your business champions, and they will be. That was my staff that put it by herself and put her name under it. <laughs> So she's in the process of preparing slides. She's also developing her own quotes as she goes along. I was really thrilled when I saw when I saw that. Thank you.